I'm walking downstairs to see Christian's room. I'm in his parents' house, where he grew up. He would come down here and hit on the punching bag. He was real big into working out and being fit. This was um, his pride and joy dirt bike that I got him when he was 16. Said he wanted that instead of a car. A sign on the wall catches my attention. A street sign. It's dirty and weathered. But the words on it are clear. Bridge out miles ahead. Local traffic only. And there's handwriting strewn across it. This was a sign that they took. He had it in his closet. And so I took it to the funeral home. And his friend signed it. And uh, right there. A lot of friends had signed it. 66 to be exact. Making a collage of multicolored messages commemorating Christian. I stared at it for a long time. I became fixated on it. Love you, brother. You truly will be missed. I'm so lucky to have met someone like you. You made a lot of people laugh, man. That was your thing. I'm so lucky to have met someone like you. I'll never forget you. Just thank you. Thank you for the memory. I'll never forget you. You truly will. You will never be forgotten, Christian. We love you, and we'll miss you, buddy. So today's video is going to be very, very different from anything I've really ever posted before. If you're not aware and you haven't been following my channel the past couple of videos or my social media or my community tab, uh, you might not know that John Lorden and myself were a part of the PI experience at CrimeCon this year, which is basically a crowdsourcing investigation. Sheila Wysocki picked the case of Christian Andriacchio, and essentially John and I were in charge of creating video cliff notes for all of the attendees of the PI experience, and we were supposed to be able to live stream the actual event for you guys. There were different rooms set up in the event, different um, uh, different exhibits. There was a ballistics expert where you know you got to go in that room. There was a room on the crime scene. There was a room on a ferro machine, uh, which is some new technology that's being used. And John and I were basically kind of like a discussion room. And we were supposed to be able to live stream that for you. We were supposed to be able to live stream our room so you guys could ask us questions about the case through the live stream. You could hear what the people that went through these exhibits had to say and what they learned, but unfortunately it didn't end up working out. The internet was absolutely terrible. Poor John, bless his freaking heart, tried so hard to get the live stream up and running. He tried his phone. We tried like two different types of internet through the hotel. It just, it didn't work. So we still wanted to get this case out to you guys. Uh, so basically what I'm gonna be doing today is telling you guys a very, very, very condensed version of this case. There is absolutely no way I could go through all of the information in this one video. I think we had at least over five hours of footage just from like our cliff notes that we did with the people from the PI experience. So it's basically a whole lot of information. So I'm condensing it down to the most kind of basic um, details. And at the end of this video, John is going to come on with me and we are going to discuss the PI experience, what we learned, how we felt about it, things we learned about the case from the people who went to talk to the experts throughout the different exhibits. So it's definitely going to be set up a little bit different, but we promised you guys we were going to do something still, despite the fact that the live stream didn't work out. So here we are to do that. Now, keep in mind I said this is a very condensed version of this case. There is actually a podcast that just released this week called Culpable. I will leave it linked down below. Please, please, please stop everything you're doing after this video. Go subscribe to this podcast and give it a five-star review. This is a podcast completely about Christian Andriacchio's death, and I have listened to the two episodes that have been released so far, and I cannot even fathom the information that's going to come out throughout this podcast. I know this case at this point like the back of my hand and the things that I found out just from I think the second episode, I had goosebumps the entire time I was listening. It is just unbelievable. This is already an unbelievable case as it is, but this podcast takes it to a whole other personal level. Um, you hear a lot of the you know background of Christian's life and his family and the different people that are involved. And 
it's just a perspective that I myself just telling the story could never, ever, ever get across. So now that that's said and done, buckle in, because here we freaking go. Christian was only 21 years old when his life was abruptly ended on February 26th, 2014. Christian was living in Meridian, Mississippi with his brother Josh at the time, his older brother in an apartment townhome sort of situation. And his life was fantastic. You know, Christian was a wildly loved young man. And if you listen to the podcast and even watch the Crime Watch Daily episodes, you will instantly, instantly see that. He was always the life of the party. He just had this pull to him. People were just glued to him because of his personality, his vibe. He was a very like go-getter kind of person. He lived life to the fullest and he brought you along with him, man. It was an absolute ride. He was funny. He was outgoing. He always had these crazy goals and he would push past every single boundary to achieve these goals. And it kind of started when he turned 18. He started working for Magnolia Marine on a tugboat, which was his dream his entire life. And his goal was to pretty much become the youngest captain at Magnolia Marine. And he was approaching that fast. He always had a great work ethic. He had started going to help his dad at work, I think when he was nine years old. So it was something that had just been instilled in him and he was great at what he did. So at a young age, he was only 21. He'd been working there since he was 18. He was making a lot of money, at least for a 21 year old. He had two cars. Um, I think I remember them saying he had jet skis. He usually had a couple thousand in the bank. He had a lockbox where, you know, he kept some cash on him. So his family life was great. He had a younger sister that he loved. I think she was around 13 or 14 at the time of his death. He had a great relationship with his parents. You know, he was planning on living with his parents as long as he possibly could. Uh, so all of that was great, but there was one aspect of his life that turned out not so great and more than likely has a whole lot to do with his death, and that was his romantic life. Christian had been dating a 17-year-old named Whitley. Now, he had been in a previous relationship with another young woman, but they decided to kind of split ways. She was going to veterinarian school, and, you know, he would go out on these 30-day hitches on these tugboats, so they're, it just wasn't compatible. They both were just on kind of separate paths at the moment, but they were kind of under this understanding that they would eventually end up back together. But, you know, after they broke up, he started dating this 17-year-old. Now, Whitley is quite the character, and I wish I could spend more time describing her because I don't think I've ever felt so strongly about someone. Um, but basically, the gist of it is that she just wasn't a great person. Uh, she had a rough childhood growing up or at least that's kind of the way she portrayed it to everybody. It's still kind of a questionable thing up in the air. Um, I've seen her say that her mother, you know, didn't want to take care of her. She had other siblings, but she was kicked out of the house. Just, she wasn't in a stable home, or at least that's what she said. And Christian's family was always the kind of family that took in everyone. You know, they wanted everyone to have a place. They wanted everybody to be loved. And Christian himself also had such a massive heart, so... They decided to basically bring Whitley in to live with them. And at first, she was a very kind and kind of quiet girl. Um, but pretty quickly, Christian's parents realized that's not exactly the case. <sighs> Within less than a month, Whitley was kicked out of Christian's parents' house. Now... There are many different reasons that all of this happened. I don't want to dive too deep into a lot of the information because a lot of this was released on the Culpable podcast, but there are a few things that I want to speak about. Whitley did not fear consequences. I guess that's the best way that I can describe it. She was naive. She was 17 years old and she would post these insane things onto her social media, like what are we gonna do today, meth or bath salts, just things that typical people would not publicly state. And she knew very well that Christian's parents saw these things and she just did not care. She just would say whatever came to her mind in the moment. 
And on top of that, she started acting very bizarre while living with them. Christian had a younger sister and he had a great relationship with her. He took care of her. As I said, she was a decent bit younger. And Whitley seemed jealous of this relationship that Christian had with his little sister. And it got to the point where Whitley would try as hard as she could to get the little sister in trouble. There was one point in time that I heard from the Culpable podcast where Christian called his mom and was like, you need to go get, you know, my little sister and you need to tell her that she needs to stop smoking and yada yada. And Christian's mom, Ray, is like, what are you freaking talking about? And he's like, Whitley just called me and said that she just saw, you know, my little sister um, smoking. And Ray, his mom was like, no, she's not. She's literally upstairs right now. So Whitley would create these problems. She would instigate all of these issues and for what? You know, it just made absolutely no sense. So she was causing problems between Christian and his little sister and, you know, Christian's mom and the little sister and between Christian and his mom. She just was shoving herself into places where she did not belong. And she also did not like the fact that Christian still really cared about his ex-girlfriend. And she really crossed a boundary at one point because she went through Christian's parents' room. And... Ray said she was sitting in bed one night and Whitley just walked in unannounced and set this picture down beside Ray. And she says, this is what I think of this. And Ray said when she looked down, it was a picture that had originally been in, in her bedroom um, of Christian's previous girlfriend. Because again, the families were close. They'd been dating since I think he was in ninth grade. I mean, years and years of relationship. And Whitley had taken it and she told Ray that her and Christian had been shooting, and so she shot a hole through Christian's ex-girlfriend's face. Now, Ray doesn't know if she actually did shoot through it or if she just stabbed through it, but either way, could you imagine being that... I don't even know the term or words to express how that makes me feel. She didn't care. She went to his parents' bedroom, took some of their belongings, destroyed it, and then brought it back and said, there you go. This is how I feel about that. So there were just so many different issues. There was also another instance where Christian sat down with his parents and said, hey, I think I should add Whitley to my life insurance policy because Christian had one through the boat that he worked on. It's a very dangerous job. Um, and there had actually been an incident, I think right before this, where he fell overboard. And his parents obviously said, absolutely not. She's 17 years old. You just met this girl. You know, I think he had previously had his ex-girlfriend on his life insurance policy. Um, but that was kind of a very, very different situation. And... When they found out the reasoning as to why Christian was asking this, it it just makes your stomach turn. So apparently, Whitley had found out about this policy. Whitley had likely found out that Christian's ex-girlfriend had been on the policy. And after this accident, she texted Christian and said, you know, I think I should be added to your life insurance policy because what's going to happen to me and the baby if something happens to you? So I know what you're thinking. You're like, oh, crap, she's pregnant. No. <laughs> She was not pregnant. There was apparently a moment where there was concern that she was, but within days they were able to figure out that she was not. But for some reason, she was still insistent that she be added to his life insurance policy. It was just a mess of a situation. And when Whitley was kicked out of his parents' home, Christian decided to leave with her. Again, he had this huge heart. He needed to protect people. He needed to take care of them. And she would have nowhere to go without him. Their relationship, however, wasn't even that great. It had never been that great because Whitley was not a trustworthy person. Imagine that. Not only for Christian, but for pretty much everyone that knew her. One of the most disturbing things that I saw while going through police records, um, reports, statements was that not even some of Whitley's closest friends spoke great about her. Um, people that said they were her best friend. People that were close to her described her as manipulative. And this is me using their exact words, manipulative, sneaky, conniving, a cheater. I mean, the list just goes on and on. These are supposed to be her best friends. When your best friends are describing you as a sneaky, manipulative, terrible person, that's probably not a very good thing. 
So when Christian would leave for these 30 day hitches on the boat, you heard one of those words, right? Cheater. That was a big issue. She would immediately go out, start talking to other guys, hang out with other guys. She would do all kinds of drugs. She didn't have a job. She was using Christian's car. I'm pretty sure using Christian's money. So he would leave and she would just have a field day with him gone. And Christian obviously felt very uncomfortable with this and he would try to nudge her in the right direction. There was even a time where he threatened to kick her out if she failed a drug test, but it just wasn't working despite all of his efforts. Whitley is the kind of person that does what she wants when she wants and does not care about the consequences or how it will hurt other people. So it was, as always, a hard situation when Christian left for work, which is what happened on the 22nd of February. Christian was scheduled for another 30-day hitch on the tugboat, and how this would work is he would leave Meridian, where he lived, drive about two hours to Vicksburg to Magnolia Marine. He would leave his car in their parking lot, which had a gate up, and he would get on the boat, and basically he didn't have access to his car until he came back. You typically are not allowed off of these boats during your hitches unless there is a serious emergency for very obvious reasons. So when Christian's parents were contacted by Christian's grandfather, keep that in mind, not the authorities on the night of February 26th, with the information that Christian had killed himself in his apartment in Meridian, they knew that something was wrong. And it wasn't just them. It was his ex-girlfriend that found out. It was his ex-girlfriend's family that found this out. It was his, you know, it was his uncles. It was his best friend. Everyone reacted to this news with, oh, he would never do that. What do you mean? He's supposed to be on the boat. He values his job. This doesn't make any sense. So here is the timeline of what happened as far as we know. And I need any and all input that you may have down below. Sheila Waisaki is always looking for new perspectives on things. I wish I could even tell you the different perspectives I saw just from the a little bit over 100 people that were at the PI experience. So talking to so many of you guys, I cannot even imagine what a lot of you might see that we have not so far. So before Christian left for this hitch on the boat, as I said, him and Whitley were having their typical problems. I guess she had gone out the night before for a Mardi Gras party with her family, and this caused an argument between the two of them. He kept telling her basically that she needed to stay home and not go out because he didn't trust her, and they pretty much were not on speaking terms when he left. On the 25th, just days after leaving, which he left on the 22nd, Christian started to randomly receive frantic phone calls while working on the tugboat from a friend named Dylan. Now, Dylan, Whitley, and Christian are kind of like the trio. Christian didn't really know Dylan and Whitley very well, and then he, you know, they kind of, he kind of met both of them at the same time, and then they all kind of got together as a group. So Dylan was basically telling Christian on the phone a string of different reasons as to why Christian needed to come home, but the straw that really broke the camel's back was when Dylan said, well, I just thought you should know that Whitley is driving around your BMW, which he had told her not to do during their argument before he left, and she was hanging out with a guy that was a known drug dealer. Christian at this point said, you know what, forget it. I've been trying to get this girl on the right track forever now. At this point, she's just being overly disrespectful. And he decided he was going to come home, he was going to kick Whitley out, get his car back, and there we go. So he decided, so he told Dylan to pick him up in New Orleans where the tugboat was docked at the moment around 7.45 to 8 a.m. on the 26th, so the following day. Christian ended up making up some crazy story about his parents fighting as an excuse to get permission to get off the boat. Now, we know this isn't true, but I think saying that is probably a lot more believable and acceptable than saying, hey, my girlfriend's nuts. I need to go and kick her out. So he did get permission and he left the boat the next morning. Now, Dylan arrived to pick him up, I think sometime around eight. Now, I don't have exact times. <laughs> the timeline is something else, you guys. I don't, I'm not even going to get into it right this moment. Um, but he was picked up at eight by Dylan in New Orleans and they drove from there to Picayune and I'm probably not saying that right, but they stopped there to get gas and drinks and then they headed straight up towards Meridian. Now they arrived in Meridian, I think at around 
30. Um, and the plan was basically what it was before. Christian was going to come in. He was going to kick Whitley out. He was going to get his car. And then he had to head back directly to New Orleans because he had to be back on the boat by 5 p.m. that night. So it wasn't going to be a long and drawn out trip. It was get there, do what you need to do, leave. Uh, but something along the way obviously went very wrong because Dylan called 911 at 4.30 that day to tell authorities that he had just found Christian dead and slumped over in the bathtub of the house. From here on, this case turns into an absolute freaking disaster. At 4.45, the first police officer shows up to the scene, followed by many other police officers and detectives, the coroner, emergency, you know, responders. Um, but in less than 45 minutes, the chief of all people shows up to the scene and says, wrap it up, shut this thing down, it's a suicide. Without even a full hour of an investigation... We all know at this point exactly what this means. A proper investigation simply was not done and could not possibly be done in less than an hour. Christian was found face down in the bathtub. He had both of his arms outside of the bathtub. His feet were crossed, which is interesting to me. And they were also about an inch into the pathway of the door. Keep that in mind. Um, the entrance wound was on the right side of his head, literally like just above his ear. And the exit wound was almost directly across on the opposite side. The bullet and the casing were both found inside of the bathtub, but there was no obvious sign of a bullet striking the bathtub anywhere. Another thing to keep in mind. But there was, however, a hole directly behind Christian beside an outlet. Now, we don't know if that's a bullet hole because, shocker, it was never tested. Um, but just again, something to keep in mind, it looks like it possibly could be, and the tip of the bullet looked like it could possibly have drywall in it. <sighs> now, the position of his body was the very first thing that took me back. And basically, his, when you walked into the bathroom, the sink was on your right, immediately followed by the toilet, and then there was the bathtub at the very end. It was a tiny bathroom. Like, you could fit one person in there and that's it. Um, as I said, slumped over, arms outside of the bathtub, and his knees were a whole 12 inches away from the bathtub. His body was just like very drawn out. Again, something you wouldn't expect to see if someone had been standing at the tub, shot themselves and fell, you know, they would kind of fall straight down into a slumping position. And then the fact that his feet were crossed, I just, anyways, there were just a whole lot of issues with this. But one of the strangest parts about the body and the positioning of everything is actually where the gun was found. So he was right-handed, entrance wound was on the right side. So I have to do a visual, it's the only way I can do it. I know this is not, you know, the most ideal way, but the gun was basically, would have had to be like this. It was found turned the opposite direction under his left hip between him and the bathtub. You know, I don't know if a lot of you guys are very familiar with, you know, the recoil from a gun. You know, if, if you shoot yourself on this side, the, it goes, it's going to go like this. The gun likely would have been thrown this way, either to the right side in the bathtub, right outside of the bathtub. But somehow, in the second that it took him to shoot himself and fall directly down, it flipped all the way over and ended up on the opposite side fast enough to where he pinned it against the bathtub. Interesting. The whole crime scene just didn't add up. The blood was reported as being very coagulated when the first officer arrived. And the timeline put him shooting himself within the hour, basically, that the officer arrived. So it wouldn't make sense for the blood to already be dried and coagulating if it had only been an hour or less. Also, again, the hole behind him 
because of how his body was positioned in the bathroom, you would assume to see some sort of strike on the bathtub to the left of Christian, and there wasn't one, so how is there a hole in the back? Now, again, granted, we don't know for a fact if that was a bullet hole, uh, but it's just questionable. There was no signs of a strike in the bathtub. You would see that. This was a 45 Kimber semi-automatic gun. Now, on top of that, the gun itself also didn't make sense, and I sure hope some of you guys are familiar with guns because it was a semi-automatic, as I said, a 45 Kimber. Um, a round was shot when he was shot, and being a semi-automatic, it, you know, instantly reloads, it's ready to go, but the gun was also found decocked. The hammer was up. That is something with a semi-automatic that you have to physically do after the fact. So how the heck? So you're meaning to tell me Christian decocked the gun, put the hammer up after shooting himself through his head and also completely rotated the gun, put it between his hip and then like extended his whole body before he got into the bathtub? <sighs> Makes absolutely no sense. And on top of that as well, authorities just didn't take a lot of the things in the bathroom that they should have. They took uh, the casing and the bullet, that is something that they took, but that's pretty much the only thing taken from the bathroom, period. When Christian's parents ended up coming afterwards to look at everything, they found a bloody t-shirt shoved behind the toilet. And from pictures I've seen, and I don't know if it was recreations, but it didn't look like just a little bit of blood. It was a lot of blood and authorities missed that entirely. Now, again, so you're meaning to tell me what Christian changed his shirt? Where'd this bloody shirt come from? Because I don't typically keep shirts covered in blood stuff behind my toilet, um, but authorities just didn't take it. And they also found a knife in the house that was covered in blood. And they brought both of these items forward to authorities to be tested when they were trying to have this looked into as a possible homicide. And everything's been lost. Evidence wasn't taken from the bathroom. The crime scene was not adding up to how it should have looked. Um, and there was not any blood spatter for the most part on like the shower curtain or the upper portion of the tub where you would expect to see it. Christian's brother was the one that had to clean up the entire bathroom, the entire crime scene. It was just a slap in the face to the family how the authorities failed to treat this case as a potential foul play situation from the get-go. Once Christian had an autopsy done, it wasn't even deemed a suicide. It was labeled as undetermined. Uh, he also had what appeared to be a fracture on the back top portion of his skull and then a small wound around right here on the front of his nose that they were able to say happened before death. But the largest mystery when it comes to the autopsy is that he had lividity on the back of his right leg. And if you're not aware of what lividity is, it is blood pooling after death. So obviously gravity is going to start pulling things down. Blood is not pumping anymore. And the blood pools in areas that are facing downward. Again, gravity. How on earth would he get lividity on the back of his right leg if those portions of his body were facing up? And keep in mind, legs were extended, body was extended, makes no sense. Nothing at all seemed to be questioned by authorities despite so many inconsistencies. Obviously, you guys have seen all the consistencies so far. They even surpass that. I just don't have time to get into all of them. And the interviews that authorities did at the time of death and afterwards are absolutely no different. Both Whitley and Dylan were questioned and their stories were so bizarre and their timelines didn't make a bit of sense, but nobody seemed to question it. Dylan, he had a very interesting and very long statement and I have read the entire thing top to bottom hundreds of times, I kid you not at this point, and I'm still finding things within it that contradict his own statements. So Dylan said he left around 3.45 or 4 a.m. to pick up Christian and he arrived in New Orleans sometime around 8 or so. Now we're not exactly sure the exact time he left or the exact time he showed up to New Orleans, but these are just guesses based on the times that we do know. On the way back to Meridian, Dylan claims that this is when he found out that Whitley and Christian were having relationship issues. He said, and I quote, 
This is when I found out why he was coming home. So Dylan is saying he had no idea why Christian was coming home until the car ride, which I find very interesting because wasn't Dylan the one that was calling Christian over and over again? Wasn't it Dylan who told him on the phone that Whitley was riding around in his BMW and was with another guy? So I don't understand how he will then tell authorities that he had no idea why Christian was coming home until the car ride. And this isn't the only issue that pops up in Dylan's statement. Dylan said they took this drive. He said it was a very typical drive, you know, other than that one little conversation about Whitley and Christian having problems. And he said when they got to the apartment, finally an argument ensued, which yes, I would expect that if Christian's coming all the way home, hours away to break up with his manipulative girlfriend. So an argument happened and Dylan said that he went upstairs and he said he started to hear a lot of screaming and heard Christian say over and over again, do you love me? So he peeked around the stairs to see Christian holding a gun to his head. He said after things calmed down, which yes, his exact statement literally goes from Christian holding a gun to his head to then things calmed down. He said they all sat down to watch a movie. After this movie ended, Dylan offered to grab everyone food to give Christian and Whitley a little bit more time alone. And apparently, as soon as he was asking this, Christian said, heck yeah, go grab Chick-fil-A. Oh, and here's my bank card. Go withdraw all the money out of my bank account. Dylan, in this time frame, after being told to do this, also offered to take Whitley's phone to get fixed because it had apparently been broken from an earlier argument. So before Dylan went to the bank and went to Chick-fil-A and took Whitley's phone to get fixed, he decided to take away Christian's gun, which makes logical sense because Christian had been holding it to his head earlier. So he, I guess, hid it behind a curtain before leaving. Now let's look at this portion of the statement real quick. Dylan was captured on security footage and admitted to authorities that an hour after he and Christian got back to Meridian, he went to try to withdraw all of Christian's money from the bank. He's saying they got home at 1130, there was an argument, they watched a movie, and then he went to run these errands. But he was captured at the bank an hour after they got back. It is a 24 minute drive alone round trip just to get to the bank. That doesn't account for time in the bank. That doesn't account for him going to Chick-fil-A. That doesn't account for him going to wherever he claimed he was going to take Whitley's phone. So that literally leaves less than 30 minutes for an argument to have happened and for them to have watched an entire movie. And I am by no means an absolute genius, but that timeline just doesn't really add up. Anyways, he unsuccessfully tried to withdraw the money at the bank. And when he realized he wasn't going to have access to this money, Instead of calling Christian to ask Christian what to do, since it's his bank account, uh, he called some friend that he had that worked at the bank, who I'm guessing was also unable to help him. So he then went to Chick-fil-A, he stated, and then he came back home where he said everything was fine and they watched yet another movie. Now, after this movie, Whitley and Christian got up and decided to go for a drive to talk about things. So Dylan decided to take a two hour nap. He then woke up, Whitley was asleep in one of the bedrooms and Christian was sitting on the couch downstairs smoking a cigarette. So Dylan decided, you know what? Now's a great time to go look at speakers at Best Buy. I'll be right back. But before he left, he decided to, for some reason, give Christian his gun back. He took it out of its hiding space. He gave it to Christian. He said, now you need to unload this gun and do not touch it again. Oh boy. Um, when authorities asked him why on earth he gave Christian his gun back, his response was, and I quote, because I, I took quotes from it, I couldn't take it with me. So the reason he gave the gun back to Christian was because he couldn't take it to Best Buy with him. I find that an odd excuse considering he didn't take it with him earlier when he went to Chick-fil-A. This wasn't a concern of his earlier. So I find it odd that, you know, before he leaves, he's like, I know I didn't take it with me earlier, but now I can't take it with me again. And this time I need to give it back to you. Anyways, he left for Best Buy and he spoke to an audio technician for a bit about these speakers. And then he said he returned to the apartment 
And I think Best Buy is about a six minute drive away from Christian's home. When he got back, he didn't see anybody. So he started calling out for people in the apartment and no one was answering. And that's when he noticed that at the very top of the stairs, you can see the bathroom door from the bottom of the stairs. It appeared as if there was a light on in the bathroom. So he said he assumed Christian was showering. So he went upstairs and knocked on the door and said, are you all right? I mean, that's definitely not going to be my first pick. Um, if I think my friend is just upstairs showering, first of all, I'm not gonna bother them. I'm going to wait until they're done. But if I did go to bother them, my first question would not be, are you all right? But he received no answer to this question. So he went downstairs where Whitley was sleeping in the bedroom, tried to wake her up and said, you know, Christian's not answering me. We need to go and check on him. Now I wanna stop again right here. First of all, the apartment is tiny. Again, he said he thought Christian was showering. You can hear the shower running from the outside of the door in pretty much any situation. Um, so that's odd to me. Him asking, are you all right, is odd to me. But the thing that I find the most odd is that he received no response from someone in the bathroom. So I find it very odd that he was so sure Christian was still in the bathroom when he went down to ask Whitley to come up and help him check on Christian. Dylan then claimed he went upstairs and again asked if Christian was all right through the door and when he didn't get a response again, he opened the door and saw Christian laying face down in a tub in a puddle of blood. Remember what I said about his feet being an inch into the path of the doorway? Interesting. Dylan said that he screamed down to Whitley that Christian was dead. Again, interesting assumption uh, before even checking on him because Dylan said he didn't even walk into the bathroom. And she ran upstairs screaming and proceeded to hold Christian while Dylan dialed 911. So as you can see, that is a roller coaster ride from start to finish. Dylan's time frame is all over the place. So they watch at least two movies, so that's about three hours long if each movie is roughly about an hour and a half, which is fairly typical. Um, so we're at three hours plus a two hour nap. So that takes us to about five hours of just watching movies and Dylan napping. They got back at 11.30, which if you take the time from 11.30 to, uh, and you add the nap and the movies, we're at about 4.30 now. 4.30 is when Dylan called authorities. Um, but that leaves no room at all for the 30 minute trip to the bank, going to Chick-fil-A, the trip to Best Buy, conversations, arguments. <sighs> Doesn't make a bit of sense. Then we have Whitley's statement. Now Whitley's entire statement was basically about their relationship and their problems. She barely even mentions, I think there's like two maybe three sentences at the very end of her very short statement about what actually happened that day. But her entire statement basically consisted of her saying that he didn't trust her, Christian didn't trust her, and that she was actually contemplating breaking up with him. But she convinced herself, and this is her own words, she convinced herself that they could make it work. She said that on the night of the 25th, Christian called her and said that he was quitting his job and he was coming home. This is kind of red flag number one in her statement because this was his dream job. He had been working very, very hard from 18 until 21 at the time of his death to become the youngest captain. It was like his life goal. He would never quit his job. He would never even joke about something like that. She then immediately jumped into him getting home. She didn't describe anything. There was no time that she listed. There was nothing pretty much. There was nothing that happened, you know, as soon as she got home, which according to Dylan, there should have been mention of a pretty large argument and Christian putting a gun to his head, but she failed to mention this in her statement. Um, but she said when he got home, he wanted to take her to a ride on a ride to Bonita and Bonita from what I have seen looks like kind of like a recreational park four minutes away from the house. Whitley said that Christian told her while they were there that between her and his mom, he couldn't make anybody happy. She then jumped from that to them being home and she said she laid down with her dog and took a nap. So her statement, I mean, it just jumps all over the place. There's gaps absolutely everywhere. No mention of the argument, no mention of her being kicked out, no mention of these movies, no mention of Chick-fil-A, no mention of the gun to his head, absolutely nothing. 
She said that Dylan later woke her up and that's when she went upstairs and saw that Christian was dead. Now, when she was asked by authority specifically, has Christian ever talked about hurting himself? Her response was, I don't think so. So now, what about earlier that day? What about when he put a gun to his head and was repeatedly asking, do you love me? Yet she says that she doesn't think he ever talked about hurting himself. She also told authorities that she did not hear any gunshot at all. And she also didn't mention if her dog reacted to any gunshot. And if you have an animal, you are probably very well aware that they react to gunshots. I used to live in the absolute middle of nowhere. There was hunting going on, you know, people partying and shooting all the time. I lived there for almost four years, three years. And uh, my dogs never, ever, ever got used to the sound of guns and guns went off every single day. So neither of their statements really make any sense. You've got one from Dylan that's like so incredibly descriptive, but still doesn't make sense to Whitley's, which has pretty much nothing even about the day of. It's not even relevant to what they really were asking her for. So it was an absolute mess. Christian, Dylan, and Whitley all had GSR tests done the day at the crime scene. If you're not aware of what that is, it's a gunshot residue test. Whitley immediately told authorities, you know, just want to let you know, but mine's going to come back positive. So they asked her why, and she said that the night before, so the night of the 25th, she had been out with a guy named Matt and his cousin Jet, and they were shooting guns. Now, this sounds like a reasonable excuse. It's very possible. It's something that a lot of people did down in Mississippi in that area, except for the fact that GSR only typically stays on your hands for, I think, four to maybe six hours tops. Uh, and that's if you pretty much don't touch anything. So basically, you're meaning to tell me she didn't wash her hands or take a shower or pretty much touch anything for 24 hours she said she was taking a nap with her dog you would think she's gonna pet her dog you touch all over sheets and blankets just moving them when you lay down for a nap so matt came forward to make a statement i think possibly on his own a couple of weeks later Matt said that he had known Whitley for a while, but they didn't really talk often. He said she was really, really wild and crazy um, and that it just wasn't like a constant friendship between them until a couple of days before Christian's death when Whitley reached out to him through Snapchat. So basically, Christian dies on the 26th, leaves on the 22nd. Matt says a few days before Christian's death, she contacts him. So to me, it seems like the second Christian left, Whitley started reaching out to guys. He specifically asked Whitley if she was still with Christian and she said that she wasn't and he actually had an entirely different girlfriend so they decided to hang out. That night they were with his cousin and I think one other person, Matt's cousin Jet decided to go and shoot guns because he had just bought a new one and Whitley was there. But contradictory to what Whitley said, Matt said she never shot a gun because she said she was way too scared. He claimed the entire time she was sitting on his lap and he was actually taking his hands to cover her ears because of how scared she was of the guns. The night then went on, they ended up having sex and at 6.30 or 7 a.m. on the 26th, Matt drove her back to her car so that he could go to work and she headed off presumably to Christian's house. Matt said he then went to work from about 7.45 a.m. to 3 p.m. and then he slept after he got home and at 8 p.m. Jet, his cousin that had been with them the night before, called him to ask him if he had heard that Christian ended his life. Now, Matt immediately called Whitley, who didn't answer her cell phone. Um, it was broken, so that could be part of it. So he decided to call a girl named Dallas that Whitley, I guess, hung out with a lot, and Whitley ended up being with her. Whitley told him that Christian had basically found out that she had been with Matt the night before and came home because they had trackers on each other's phones and he was upset. And she said that they drove around to a few places to talk about the problem and then they went back to the house. And she said that she then went to sleep with Christian. So she said they both lay down to take a nap together. And then she told Matt she herself woke up to a gunshot and she herself ran upstairs to find Christian dead in the bathroom with a bullet wound to his throat. 
So this contradicts her claim that she told authorities that she never heard any gunshots. It also does not match up with where exactly Christian was shot. More contradictions just keep on flowing in. Matt said he tried to basically avoid her after this and she kept on trying to get in contact with him and then he said after a week he finally confronted her because he was hearing all these rumors and stories that just weren't matching up to what she had originally told him. So he contacted Whitley and said, you know, did you find Dylan like you originally told me? So he contacted Whitley and said, did you find Christian like you originally told me or was Dylan the one that found him? She completely changed her story, saying that Dylan was actually the one that found him. She didn't wake up to any gunshots at all. Dylan was the one that woke her up. He then asked where Christian was shot because she had originally said in the throat, but everyone else was saying in the head above his ear. Again, she said, she never said he shot himself in the throat, that it was in his head. Willie then went on to say to Matt that Christian had mentioned killing himself earlier that day, which again contradicts her saying he had never threatened hurt himself before. And she told Matt that she directly told Christian that if he was going to do it, to not shoot himself in the face. There are statements that prove her original story. There are text messages from Matt that prove she changed her story. It's an absolute freaking disaster. It's like the stories changed once they got their information together a little bit more. But this isn't all that Matt really had to offer up. Whitley had apparently been calling him from Christian's phone all throughout the day of the 26th. Basically, she had been asking him to come and pick her up because her and Christian were fighting. Now, we know that he was working from 7.45 to 3 p.m. According to the time frame, Christian should have been alive at this time. And according to her own story, if Christian came home because he was mad she was with Matt and he was still alive at the time, I highly doubt he would willingly hand over his cell phone to her to call Matt to come and get her. So this really throws into question, you know, when did these calls start? When did she start calling Matt? Because I think that is the actual time of death for Christian. We know her phone was broken. We are very well aware of that. Um, so if she needed to use a phone, maybe she lied to him. Maybe she was like, I need to call my mom. But again, such a small apartment that I just don't see that as being a huge possibility. When she even went to the police department, when she was at the police station to be questioned, she had Christian's phone. She had his freaking phone on her and she would not give it up to authorities. They knew that she had to have it because it was nowhere in the apartment. And finally, when they told her, you're literally never leaving until you give us the phone, she finally reluctantly handed it over. Uh, it also came out that when she found Christian, he is literally dead. She took a cigarette out of his pocket to go and smoke it. Your dead freaking boyfriend and your first thought is to literally steal the cigarettes out of his pocket? <sighs> Matt also was able to give up information that he heard kind of through the grapevine. And again, this is speculation, but apparently Matt said that Dylan and Whitley had some sort of potential sexual relationship that he had heard through quite a few people that they did and uh, that Whitley had stayed at his house a good handful of times. So at this point, Whitley's statement is changing constantly. And interestingly enough, both Dylan and Whitley's GSR tests came back as positive. Now, Whitley did have an excuse, kind of, saying that she had shot a gun the night before, but we're not even sure if that happened. And it's already questionable because of the time frame that that GSR would even still be there. But Dylan never really offered up an excuse as to why he had gunshot residue on his hands. We do know that Dylan claimed to have handled Christian's gun 
earlier on in the day, but unless it had been recently shot, I doubt that he would have had gunshot residue on his hands. Um, if it wears off that fast, I'm assuming just putting a gun in a holster in and out a few times or handling it a few times, the gunshot residue would pretty much be gone. So many questions. Um, this is not even the tip of the iceberg. You will find so much information out that I have not even stated here in the two episodes from Culpable. You could watch the series that John already has on this case um, on his channel and find out so many more things that will have your mind just spinning as to why there has been nothing done. The authorities refuse to open this case back up. It is a closed case. It was deemed a suicide despite the fact that the evidence just does not suggest that. The autopsy doesn't suggest that. Um, the statements are questionable to say the very least. The timeline that Dylan gave doesn't make a bit of sense. You know, it's questionable enough if you were just to say, you know, Dylan called frantically asking Christian to come back, um, takes Christian to the home with his girlfriend that he's supposed to break up with, and then an hour later, Dylan's trying to take all of his money out. That alone is questionable, but you add in all these other details, and I just cannot understand as an officer how on earth you could ignore that information. I, I, I do not understand. And Christian's family has fought tooth and nail. And pretty much all of the information you are hearing is because they have worked so freaking hard to get it. There would be no information in this case if they hadn't documented everything. If they hadn't pursued this as if they were law enforcement themselves. To add on more interesting information that I learned along the way, we know that Christian's car was parked in Vicksburg, where Magnolia Marine is in their parking lot. It is a secured parking lot. At some point, early morning hours of the 26th, I think between 2 a.m. and 7 a.m., his car was moved. We know it wasn't Christian because Christian was on the boat, but something that was in the car is missing. Remember that lockbox I was talking about earlier with all the money, I think about $7,000? Um, that was in there. A gun was in there. No one's even sure if the gun that was in the lockbox was the gun that was found with Christian. We know based on the timeline, there's no way that he got off the boat and him and Dylan drove all the way back to Vicksburg and then all the way to Meridian. It, the time frame just does not allow for that. So who on earth went and moved Christian's car? Does that make money a motive here? Um, uh, John Lord had made a great point when we were at the PI experience of, you know, it's interesting that he doesn't even trust the people that were typically in his house, Whitley and Dylan, enough to leave money and a gun there. He felt like it was safer locked up in his car in a parking lot. Unfortunately, there were no cameras in this parking lot, so we have no idea who could have possibly gotten in there. Um, did someone have a key? Was it maybe uh, an extra key that was kept somewhere in Christian's house? Was an extra key on the key ring for the second car that Whitley was seen driving? There are just so many questions here and nothing makes a single bit of sense. Now, this is when John and I are going to get into our experience, the PI experience and the things that we learned. John is gonna have a lot more insight when it comes to the other experts. We didn't get to go through the exhibits ourselves, but John did have an opportunity to speak to quite a couple of them and basically hear, I think, the ballistics expert's opinion before he, he got to spend a lot more time with these experts. So I think he's going to have a lot of interesting things for you guys to hear. Um, we heard a lot of interesting theories and opinions in the PI experience. So sit tight and let's just go ahead and roll into that. All right, you guys, for this portion of the video, like I had mentioned previously, I am going to be speaking to the one and only 
John Lorden about the PI experience. Um, as I said as well, he worked so hard to get that live stream going and it just was not working for us. He was trying so hard. I've already said it once, bless you, John. <laughs> he was also having to upkeep the conversation as well. So he's basically a wizard. Oh, well, thank you so much, Danielle. And I want to say I am very privileged and honored to be your first guest on the channel ever. I know. And he's the reason you're even seeing this setup. If you watch his channel, this is <laughs> typically what it's, it's looking like if he's interviewing someone and we just spent the past, I don't even know how long, trying <laughs> to get me to learn it. <laughs> I'm here to help. I'm always here to support you. You know that. So for the live stream, what our plan originally had been was to kind of show us speaking with the different groups. So there were, I think, five total kind of exhibits that they went through. Um, and we were one of them where we basically just had a giant discussion on how everyone felt about each room that they went into. Um, I know there was a ballistics room, there was the crime scene, a discussion room, the Pharaoh, and then us, right? That's all of them? Yeah. Yep. Um, and unfortunately, it didn't end up working out, but we learned a whole lot. John and I didn't really have the ability to go through some of the exhibits, but he uh, was actually able to speak to a couple of people beforehand, and he's created an awesome list for us to go through some extra information that we learned while at the PI experience. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, I kind of got roped into the setup of the PI experience. I bumped into Sheila Wysocki in the hotel uh, lobby. And she's like, oh, we're going to go start, you know, looking at the rooms and running through this. You want to come along? And literally my afternoon just disappeared. <laughs> um, but it was it, so insightful. And I was with all the experts and I was hearing about what they were going to present. And Sheila kept striking up this conversation between people that had differing opinions and then trying to uh, have, you know, just capture them working that out. She literally took out her phone and started recording these conversations. So I was there for all of that. And I wanted to hit on some of those points here. And I think um, because we couldn't get the live stream going, I think it's super important that uh, we did this video um, together here today. And I just wanted to thank all of you for coming into the folds of this case. Uh, I know the family appreciates having more eyes more brains mm -hmm. and more hearts on this case. And it just means so much to me that we're able to do this um, and share it with all of you. So one of the things that was most touching was the family was actually there. And yeah. after the experience, um, we were able to ask them questions and some people asked some really good questions, particularly of Christian's brother, Josh, who also lives at the apartment. One of the things we learned was that the apartment usually was not that messy. And I've put out some videos on my channel where you can see some photos of it and it looks like it's it's really messy. Yeah, and I wasn't able to touch a whole ton on it, but um, I probably will have inserted pictures if I'm able to. There were cigarette butts everywhere. I mean, trash. It looked like they were putting their cigarettes out with a knife. Um, trash was overflowing. There were holes that looked like they were punched in the walls. And I think that has a lot to do with the hole that was found in the bathroom that could potentially be a bullet hole because we were, you know, the same question we got over and over again was, would that hole have been there before? You know, is that something that was typical? And Josh really, he got up there and he was like, I cleaned the entire house top to bottom before I left about three to four weeks before this all happened. Um, and that means the hole that was seen downstairs, there was one in the living room that wasn't there. Um, that kind of makes your mind go down this tunnel of had there been some sort of fight downstairs, um, you know, and it also leaves such a huge possibility that that hole in the bathroom was in fact from a bullet. Clearly there was some sort of crazy partying, something going on at this apartment. He was very clear that oh, yeah. the, the, the hole was not there in the bathroom. And that hole was a big point of contention with several of the experts. The ballistics expert does not think that we can necessarily lean on that hole being a bullet hole. Uh, some of the other experts think it absolutely is a bullet hole, like the Pharaoh expert, for example, uh, and was even trying to use it to figure out a trajectory of where the shot would have been fired from. So. A lot of different opinions when it comes to that hole, but knowing from Josh that the hole was not there, mm -hmm. certainly an imp 
important consideration. And I have looked into other cases, Danielle, where um, there's one case that comes to mind in particular where it looks like a young woman may have been murdered um, by the person that she married that day. And uh, he invited a bunch of friends over and they ransacked the place. I mean, the apartment was just completely thrashed. Yeah. And I'm wondering if we're seeing something like that in this case, if there was uh, kind of a disregard, obviously, for his life that took place, but then also for all of his property and for his home. Um, well, I mean, unfortunately, I I think a lot of people have probably made their opinions on Whitley and something like that wouldn't wouldn't really surprise me, you know. We heard also at the PI experience that friends that were her friends at that point in time or any point in time are still scared of her. You know, it seems like if she didn't get something she wanted, if someone crossed her the wrong way, she would do pretty much anything. And, um, you know, I, I know from the culpable episode that she was so just angry. A picture of Christian's ex-girlfriend was in the house that she went to the extent of stabbing a hole through this girl's face in a picture. I mean, seems like she'll do pretty much anything to make her feelings known. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, also Josh, um, was asked if it would be normal for Christian to not leave his money at home because we've heard this story about a lockbox that was kept in his Jeep that was parked at his workplace. Um, Josh said that, yeah, he felt like Christian wouldn't leave a significant amount of money at home. And when we asked, are you, was there a reason for that? He said, well, specifically, I'm, I'm sure he believed that Whitley would have stolen it if it was left at home. So some very interesting insight there. Mm, yep, exactly. And, you know, one thing I was actually thinking about timeline wise, because another kind of circle of conversation that happened at the PI experience was, well, who could have gotten to this lockbox? We mm. were talking about spare keys and, you know, all these different possibilities. And I find it interesting that the time that this car was possibly moved, broken into was between 2 a.m. and 7 a.m. And this is almost the exact time timeline she was with Matt. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's curious. And also we have the text from or the uh, tweet from Dylan talking about the trip that he's making that morning. And that tweet talks about them stopping at the spot where the Jeep is. Now, we don't think that he actually made that trip because of a receipt that we see. Um, but once again, it's just very interesting that this this Jeep with this box that supposedly had money and a gun in it, uh, keep popping up in this story as well. Mm -hmm. Very interesting thing that we learned at the PI experience was that the police captain at the time, who thankfully uh, lost his job pretty soon after that, not related yep. to this case, but uh, he also lived at that same complex. And uh, the rumor is kind of that the captain might have called into the people that were responding on the scene and said, you know, uh, he just killed himself. Just, uh, yeah, roll this, just shut this all down. And he was, he was newly elected, correct? I'm trying to make sure I remember uh, that right. Or, or there was, I, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think the, um, the mayor had just given him the job essentially. And, you know, people are wondering, was that influenced in some way? You know, yeah. you don't want to, the mayor to find out that there's been a murder in your apartment complex when you're the, the new chief on the scene. Exactly. Um, a big question that I have, um, is about that Chick-fil-A cup. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you've covered this with your audience, but I didn't, they're... I didn't get around to it. No, we, oh, at this point they've heard all about Chick-fil-A and that, you know, was one of the plans on one of the errands that Dylan ran, but I didn't mention the yeah. Chick-fil-A cup. So there are two cups that can be seen in the photos that we actually have seen of this. One of them is in the living room on the table. And there is another Chick-fil-A cup that is actually in the tub. Um, where, where Christian is, and obviously uh, it's, it's in blood. Um, I'm curious about this because if we look at the possibility that he was murdered uh, earlier in the day, possibly before that trip, because that mm -hmm. same trip to go get Chick-fil-A is tied up with this trip to the bank to supposedly yeah. empty Christian's bank account. Yeah. 
Um, so f- for me, I'm wondering about that whole string of events and if what's the likelihood that, you know, he, he's going to be murdered after someone does something like that. I think we're looking at the steps Dylan is taking. Mm-hmm. And if we roll this back to Christian actually being killed earlier, that Chick-fil-A cup has to be placed. And um, that's that's kind of where I'm struggling with it. Was it just literally thrown in the tub after the fact to try to paint this story of, well, look, obviously he was still alive when I came back from Chick-fil-A because yeah. he a- ate his lunch and he had he his had own drink. drink. Cup, yeah. Yeah. Um, but then we also have the other bottle. Yeah. We have the beer bottle that's in the bathroom as well. And, you know, this was something interesting. And I, I was almost convinced that that could tie into a second person being there. Um, but to kind of hit on a note already right now about some other information we found out, he had no drugs or alcohol in his system. So, mm-hmm. I mean, there was a beer bottle there, and I definitely think it's possible that could mean a second person was sitting in there with him. It would be difficult because someone would literally have to be in the bathtub um, because the bathroom yeah. was so small. But I don't know. And it just feels like there are a lot of things in this crime scene that are placed. And I, I understand it's easy to think that about a lot of different crime scenes, but the level in this particular case, I mean, the placement of his body, the placement of the gun, the Chick-fil-A cup, if that hole is a bullet hole, that means that the bullet was placed into the tub. Right. After it was pulled out of the wall. Exactly. Which... It, I, I've looked at the pictures, and my opinion is some item was used to actually extract the bullet mm-hmm. from from the wall. Um, but yeah, there's there's just so much to it that seems wrong. The fact that his knees are actually about a foot away yeah. from the tub, um, his arms are both at his side while his body is laying into the tub. So how did that happen? Uh, if he did this to himself, at least one of his arms would have been up, and as he fell forward it's more likely that one of his arms would have been in the tub. Well, I mean, if you think about it, if he's standing up and he shoots himself, at -hmm. that point, I would assume almost all of his body would have been in the bathtub. You know what I mean? And if he was kneeling down in front of the bathtub, his knees would have been right up against that bathtub. And I don't see, you know, him, I mean, stretching his body all the way out that would be like a slump down again that's just my assumption because i i mean i've never seen a recreation or anything like that um but just i feel like every way you look at it it just does not add up with the placement of his body even it's it's interesting you bring up the standing position Mm -hmm. that that's a very interesting thought but in terms of how he had fallen if that's true that means that his sternum would have knocked on exactly. the edge of the tub and i'm pretty sure damage. they would have yeah they would have noted some damage at that point so three of the experts um talked about their differing opinions of where he likely was in the bathroom at the time that he was shot one of the experts believes that he was sitting on the toilet which is one of my early assumptions in this Mm -hmm. case. Once I started looking into pictures that Sheila was sending me and taking all this on, uh, the thing that really supports that is if that hole is indeed a bullet hole, the height of it is just about right for Mm -hmm. someone that would have been sitting on the toilet. The direction is right for it entering through his right side and exiting out the left uh, with the direction that he would have been sitting on on the toilet. So that's a pretty compelling one. The Pharaoh expert... Uh, did the analysis on the whole and actually tried to, uh, you know, figure out the tra- the trajectory of it. He believes that Christian could have been sitting on the edge of the bathtub, but he would have been facing a bit of a weird way. He would have actually been extremely close to the wall that's right in front of him. Okay. Um, just a little bit of a weird situation. I don't know why you would necessarily sit in that direction, facing a wall, you know, with your knees basically touching the wall. Um, and then taking the shot uh, yeah, effectively. That definitely would not be someone's first option when they would go to sit down. Yeah, yeah. And then you have the ballistics expert who discounts the hole in the wall as being a bullet hole. He believes that Christian was actually standing at the sink in front of the mirror and that someone was standing outside of the bathroom, reaches in through the door and shoots him. And if you, uh, we've seen photos, yeah. or, or I know I've seen photos of the entry and exit wounds. Mm-hmm. 
the entry wound is actually kind of behind his ear. Yeah, it's a very, um, it's like right above and like a little bit behind. Yeah, so it's that theory really grabbed me. We also have uh, Dylan mentioning on his 911 call that he saw some blood outside of the bathroom in the hall that's right outside of there. I mean, that and then the fact that his feet were an inch into the doorway makes me think that the door was never shut. Yeah, yeah. And think of the direction that's going on with that gunshot. Mm -hmm. uh, any matter that is coming out of Christian at that point is heading towards the tub. Yep. Already right off the bat. So pretty compelling information from all three experts, even though they all believe very different <laughs> things. But like I said earlier, the one thing that uh, they were all clear on is they do not think that he did this to himself. And, you know, when it comes to what the ballistics expert thinks as well, it kind of matches up with probably one of the largest theories that the PI experience attendees brought forward, which was that he was lured into the bathroom. Yeah. That was, yeah. I mean, every group that came in, every single one was like, well, we think someone was in the bathtub and waiting or luring him. And then someone came from outside um, there. I mean, it would, yeah. it would match up because I don't think he would just, I don't know. Someone was blocking his exit. I can completely see it. We also asked several groups about um, who do they think is responsible for actually pulling the trigger. And they were pretty strong that they thought Dylan was the responsible party for pulling the trigger. However, that they thought Whitley was likely pulling the strings of the situation and uh, being kind of the puppet master behind all this. So, Absolutely. Um, you know, and that would makes sense because another portion that I talked about talked about earlier on in my video was that he had gunshot residue on his hands Dylan mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he gave no explanation for that and you know that that's one point that I really wish I could have spoken to a ballistic expert about because I honestly wonder would he have gotten that on his hands by just taking the gun earlier I mean, if we know it, it rubs off on a person within a couple of hours, that gun would have had to have been shot probably recently. Yeah, also depends on the location of the of the gunshot residue yeah. where it's found. So yeah, if you know if the gun was shot uh, and then it transferred to him by him handling it, you know, if the GSR report shows that it's on his palm or on the interior of his hand, that might make sense for a transfer of that kind. Uh, we don't have a location, right? They didn't. No, we don't. We don't have a location on those reports, unfortunately. We just have the report on Christian, which states that gun, what they believe is gunshot residue, is found on the outside of his left hand and the palm of his right hand. And the interesting and thing about that is Christian is right-handed. Right his hand would have been closed around the gun. There wouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, a lot and, of troubling information. Exactly, and that was kind of another thing that we spoke about in the PI experience was what's one of the first things you're probably going to do if someone were to put a gun to you? You're going to hold, you know, your hand up. and Yeah, yeah. <sighs> or he might have even been trying to, to grab, grab it the at gun, that point. Just yeah. something. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of different conditions there, but... Mm -hmm. So um, on top of that, there's one thing that's been nagging at me since the PI experience, and I've been thinking about the order of events that Dylan has given us for that day, which you could almost have a whole hour discussion on itself. That's basically I mean, what this video was. <laughs> yeah, the guy has watched two movies, yeah. he's taking a nap, he's running all over the place, getting Whitley's phone fixed, going to the bank because his friend said, take all my money, uh, going to Chick-fil-A. But then there's this strange trip to Best Buy to supposedly yeah. talk to a car audio technician about some speakers. Uh, that's really been sticking at me lately. The time frame for that trip um, is is pretty interesting because it's later in the day. Mm -hmm. It's basically where he's gone to when supposedly Christian had done this to himself. I'm wondering what that conversation with the supposed audio tech is about. Maybe. Maybe Dylan is using it as an alibi. Yeah. Maybe he did go to Best Buy and legit, you know, ask someone, hey, I'm looking at some speakers for my truck. Yeah. Um, or is this a friend of his? Was he seeking information of some kind to try to help him with what was going on, knowing that, you know, Christian had been dead uh, for possibly hours at that point? 
it's just such a bizarre thing to want to do. Um, you know, John and I had spoken about the fact that Christian was technically supposed to be back at the boat at five. You know, could Dylan not know that? Maybe. Um, could he have planned to do that? Also a possibility. Unfortunately, we don't know, but I feel almost like everything, everything in his timeline is strange, but there's such this weird feeling I have from the point where he leaves for Best Buy. He gives Christian his gun back, and then his excuse to authorities is, I couldn't take it with me. Well, he wasn't worried about that when he went to Chick-fil-A. He right. left it at the house then. So how come all of a sudden he's like, oh, wait, now that I'm leaving, you know, and Whitley's asleep, let me just <laughs> let me just give this back to him. It just seems bizarre. And then the way that he worded it, you know, unload that and don't touch it. Right. It's just strange. Right. And it's, you know, it's only a six minute drive to Best Buy. It would have been the closest place he could have gone to, which yeah. is also fascinating. Well, and there's also the discrepancy about, you know, Dylan says that when he picked up Christian, that Christian effectively had left his job and mm -hmm. that security had been notified and the sheriff so the was sheriff, notified. Yeah. yeah. And then Whitley kind of echoes the same thing that Christian had quit his job that day. But when you talk to the company, they say, no, he just had a day pass and he was basically coming back to work at five mm -hmm. o'clock. So if Dylan was really a friend of his, that was a good enough friend to come pick him up in the morning exactly. and not take him to Vicksburg where his Jeep was. And that means he would have needed a vehicle to get back to work yeah. at five or he would have needed a ride. It seems pretty likely that Dylan might have been the person that was supposed to give him a ride back to work. And is that a reason why we're hearing these stories that don't make a lot of sense when you talk to the actual employer versus Dylan and Whitley about yeah. Christian's job. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's a big old mess. <laughs> it is, it is. But uh, thankfully we have a lot of really good brains on it. There mm -hmm. is now the new Deep Dive podcast that's in on it. Um, investigators are still working on this. And I'm very thankful that we might see some developments in the near future. With Sheila on it, I have almost no doubts about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she, she really, really goes after it. And like John was just saying, and like I said earlier on in this video, put any thoughts and opinions and things you have down below because I plan on going through everything I can and kicking it on over to Sheila. You know, she, she doesn't want people to always agree with her. She wants you to have a different perspective. She wants you to see things a different way. It's like when she would throw these kind of bait questions out to the investigators. She knew they weren't going to agree, and she's like, perfect. <laughs> Here's yeah. this question. Now go at it. Like, I want to I wanna hear what comes out of this. So I've got, I've got a lot of faith. She's not someone that kind of shuts down ideas right away and shuts out people's theories. So with as many eyes as I'm sure are on this case at this point between your coverage, the PI experience, the podcast, and now my coverage. I've got, got a lot of hope. Yeah, yeah, I do too. I also just wanted to share with you guys that Christian's mother has started a charity in his honor. It is called Magnolia Sun. That's S-O-N. You might want to check it out and you could possibly make a donation. Uh, effectively, they buy shoes and clothing for underprivileged children. So, yep. The family was incredible. Um, yeah. It was, it was definitely, it was definitely hard. They were sitting in the back of John and I's room for majority of the conversation, and the strength that it probably took to sit down and really hear. I mean, we were obviously very respectful in our discussion, but to hear mm -hmm. people's opinions and you know, that day acted out over and over and over again. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Strong, yeah. strong family. It's a double-edged sword, I'm pretty sure, because um, it's painful to hear all those details, mm -hmm. but there's also the hope that you are taking steps to actually move things forward and to find the truth for yourself and possibly bring justice to this situation. And I know for the family from the previous PI experience, the Cruz family, um, they're really feeling good about their chance of justice arriving in that case. And mm -hmm. we're only talking a year after that experience. So I'm hoping that we see some really good things for the Andriacchio family as well. Absolutely. Well, on that note, you guys, I want to thank you, John, so much for being on my channel here with me today and talking about this again 
We tried really, really hard to have the live stream up for you guys. If I can find some good clips that we managed to catch, I'll try to attack them onto the very end of this video. Do not forget to go and subscribe to John. He's absolutely amazing. And John, I haven't even said anything to you yet, but I, I already mentioned later on in the video um, that this is something that I think I would love to do in the future on my channel is, you know, for us to kind of maybe go into different cases and be able to sit down and have this conversational piece. I know we've we've collabed before. You guys remember last Crime Con, we ended up talking about Noah Davis right afterwards. Um, but yeah. this is, I like this. I like this conversation that we can have going on and kind of bounce off of each other. Um, so hopefully you're okay with that. that because I've already signed you up for it. I've been signed up. No, <laughs> absolutely. I would love that. And I know um, that a lot of fans out there want to see us do that type of work together. I know people love crime after crime, yeah. but there are other people that want to see us um, kind of in our native format, which is the more serious topics. So, yeah, yeah no, I'd absolutely be up for that. All right. Well, I want to thank you guys so much. Go subscribe to John. And now let's finish out the video. That is it for today's video, you guys. Let me know how you enjoyed it. I absolutely love working with John Lorden. So if this is something that you guys would like to see kind of on a more regular basis, him and I kind of taking on a case, maybe doing a couple of videos on it or something, please go ahead and let me know. On that note, definitely go and subscribe to John Lorden. I do not think there is any true crime YouTuber in this whole entire genre that deserves more subscribers than he does. He is the most real, the most honest, and the most respectful true crime YouTuber. I look up to this man like no other. You guys already know that. I've been raving about him at this point for like two years. Um, so definitely go and subscribe to his channel. Also, do not forget to go and subscribe to the Culpable Podcast. I'm not kidding when I'm saying I found out so much information just listening to these two podcasts and I've worked on this case for so long. Granted, I obviously will never probably know everything, um, but it is just such an interesting approach to a podcast and hearing almost like the candid conversations and experiences that Christian's family has revolving around him and the way they just treat everything is so amazing, so respectful, and it allows the family to tell a story and it allows the people that loved Christian to tell a story. And again, as I said before, me, I can't ever do anything like that. I have no ability to tell a story the way that the people directly involve can. And it would mean the world to me if you guys went and checked this podcast out. It helps the family so much more than you know. Pressure is what needs to happen to crack this wide open, you guys. There are people out there that know something and they are keeping their mouth shut and they are the people that need to come forward. There is no better person than Sheila to work on a case like this because she is the most resilient, strong, intelligent person I think I have ever come in contact with. She is a freaking force to be reckoned with. So if you are one of those people, just know she probably has you on a list and she will make her way to you. But yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and go. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to become part of the Helen fam so we can hopefully bring them home together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.